Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church, and welcome to our assembly and our time to worship the Lord, pray to the Lord, receive instruction through His Word. We're going to break the bread and drink the cup at the Lord's table today, and all of it is worship to the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you all stand up with me, please? Let's all stand up, and I'm going to open us with a prayer, and then we're going to begin to sing. Oh, and welcome to those of you who are tuning in online as well. Okay, everyone, here we go. Let's begin our service now with a prayer. Let's pray to the Lord. Our dear and most holy, almighty God, almighty Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who gives us our lives, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Israel, the God of the living, the God and Father of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Hallelujah. We gather together this morning, Lord God, in sacred assembly. We come together, Lord God, to worship you, to sing praises to your holy name, to pray, to preach, to fellowship and encourage one another. Thank you so much, Lord God, for the privilege that it is to assemble like this in your name. Thank you for each person who's here, for each person who's on the way, for each person who's tuning in online. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for this assembly and thank you for every assembly everywhere in the world where they have gathered to glorify the great name of Jesus, the one name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And every place and in the heart of every person who gathers today anywhere to worship you, Almighty Yahweh, in the name of Jesus, according to the truth of your holy word and by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we pray that you would be blessed and pleased with every assembly and that your work of edification would be done in your church. We worship you. We praise you. You are awesome in all of your works. We read in the Bible of what you've done and we read in the Bible of what you're yet going to do. And we realize you are awesome and magnificent and so powerful above anything that we can comprehend. Wisdom that is immeasurable, unattainable in our minds. And yet you give it to us when we ask in faith for it. You are so awesome. We bless you and praise you. We thank you, Lord God, that you have delivered us from our sins and the way you did it is just so terrible and so beautiful and awesome at the same time. You gave the Lord Jesus, your only begotten Son, and Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we know that when you were here, you fully obeyed your Father. You were holy in all of your works, the only one who's lived who's ever been. And then you laid down your life as a sacrifice and took the penalty for our sins. You received in your death the justice of the Father against sin. You became sin for us. You were buried, and on the third day you rose from the dead, you ascended back to heaven, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and there you are today, worthy, worthy is the Lamb, worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. And just as you promised, you have sent the Holy Spirit, you, God, living in us. Praise your holy name. And we thank you for all of this. We thank you for redeeming us and making a way for us to become the children of God. We are justified through faith in Christ. We are adopted as the children of God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit and we have the promise of everlasting life. Help us, Lord God, having these precious promises to always abound in the work of you while we're here, knowing that our work, our labor in the Lord is never in vain. And now we sing songs of praise to you and pray that everything that happens in this assembly would be pleasing to you and be glorious in your sight and glory in your holy name. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody, here we go. Let's sing to the Lord.
Praise the Lord. We're going to sing a glorious day now. 
So let's sing this song of praise to the Lord and then we'll have the Lord's song.
just before we go to the Lord's Supper, uh, Brother Phil has a song here that he's going to sing for us to get our to get our hearts and our minds set in the right place. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I forgot my microphone. Hold on. Sorry about that. It does. With increasing frequency. <laughs> that song, of course, points us to, uh, brings us right up to the Lord's Supper beautifully. Um, Jesus in the garden, famously, prayed 
And uh, when he prayed, one of the things that he prayed was, if it's possible to let the cup pass from him. And, uh, but, of course, he prayed famously what? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Just heroic, if I can use that word, courageous, but above all of that, humble and obedient and above anything else, love, right? Love for us. Love for his Father. And love for us. To go through with that. And then, of course, he was, he was comforted. Angels came and ministered to him and, and, uh, and he courageously went through with what we are going to celebrate right now. And the observance of the Lord's Supper is one of the real high moments of Christian worship because we stop to practice something. There, there are not a lot of things in the church that are like rituals or, 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 or things that are prescribed, ordinances that we're called to, to actually act on. This is one of the very few things is that we're told that we should break bread. We're told in the book of Acts that the early church, one of the pillars of the ministry of the early church was that they gathered to break bread, for the breaking of bread. That's a reference to the breaking of bread at the Lord's table because, why? As Jesus himself taught, the bread that we eat is a representation of his body, which was given for us and broken for us. And the cup that we drink, it represents his blood, which was shed for us, that our sins might be washed away, and was shed so that the new covenant would be sealed. And it is that new covenant that everything we just sang about, and everything that we live and hope for, and trust in, and, and with a confident faith look ahead to, it's all wrapped up in, in the new covenant. Salvation. That which we could never achieve in and of ourselves. Look, all humanity of all history was given its life by God. Every good thing and every blessing that we have is from God. And blessed with every good thing, man took it, walked in it, and ran away from God as fast as he could. And while enjoying all of God's blessings, proceeded with glee to disobey every one of his commands and to even make images for himself to worship. God at one point destroyed the entire world with a flood back in the days of Noah. And that's honestly a picture of what we all deserve. That's what all of mankind of all time deserves. You may think that's bleak, but it's justice. It's justice from a righteous God. And God cares about justice. Well, it's what Jesus did that was the implementation of God's justice to make a way for us to be redeemed. We look at this and we participate in this and we might be inclined to mourn or, or, or to, feel like, to feel like, you know, even a little angry that Jesus was in human terms treated so unfairly. But what sometimes we miss is that this is God's justice. When Jesus died on the cross, that was God's justice. The prophet Isaiah said that it pleased Yahweh to bruise him, the Messiah, his son. That is to say, when Jesus died on the cross, when his body was broken and his blood was shed, that was the justice of his father against sin. Jesus had committed none. So Jesus was not receiving justice for his own sin because he committed no sin. So it could only be one other thing, and that is that Jesus was receiving the justice against sin for others. Enter you and I. God calls us to him, self, by faith in his son. And when we eat and drink, we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made to receive in his own flesh the justice of God against our sin so that we, through faith, might enjoy the blessings and the promises of the new covenant.
the forgiveness of sins, justification, reconciliation with God, new birth, the assured promise and hope of everlasting life, a place in his kingdom, the resurrection of the dead, a new body that is incorruptible and will serve and worship our Lord forever a place in his kingdom, a place in the new heavens and the new earth which are to come. When we eat and drink, you remember that. When we eat and drink, you give God thanks and praise in your heart for that. We should examine ourselves. We should examine ourselves and make sure we're participating this in a worthy manner. The Bible warns us about that. So I'm going to give you some moments of quiet here. And right before we eat and drink, each one of us alone in our own thoughts, in our own heart with the Lord, I want you to pray. I want you to examine yourself. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that that relational day-by-day aspect of your walk with God, God restores that in compassion and complete and total justice when we confess our sins to him. Maybe now in this quiet is a time to do that. But examine your hearts and make sure you are participating in a worthy manner. What's the worthy manner? I've never sinned? Well, forget that. That's obviously not it. The worthy manner is what? You're humble and you're trusting. You are humble. You're not gripping to your sin. You're not walking wantonly and carelessly with no fear of God regarding our proclivity, proneness to wander, as the hymn writer said, and sin. Confess your sins, and in all humility, prepare your heart to participate in this. I'm going to ask you to, if you would kindly make sure your phones are silent, and I'm going to ask you if you would kindly make sure nobody gets up and walks around during this. It's the high moment of Christian worship, and you are blessed to participate in something that Jesus himself instituted right before he went out and did what Phil sang about and what happened here that we're going to read about in a moment. So let's give our full attention and reverence to our participation in this. Take some moments of quiet in your own thoughts and in your own heart before God now. And... uh, When I'm satisfied, I guess that we've had enough time for that, not that there ever can be totally enough time. I will uh, begin to read uh, the Gospel of Mark's account of what Christ suffered for us to bring us salvation. Go to the Lord in your thoughts and your heart now. After Jesus did this with his own disciples, he went out and, you know, he was betrayed, handed over and taken to the house of the chief priest where the religious leaders among the Jews found him guilty of blasphemy and condemned him to die. They didn't want to do that themselves, so they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and that's where this account picks up. 
Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, it was Passover, at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Bar Abbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour And they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, The King of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors, which very purposefully ties this to Isaiah 53. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, Descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi! Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come down to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Hallelujah. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and of Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. And then, of course, we know what happened on the third day. They went back to that tomb. The stone was gone. They went inside. It was empty. And an angel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen just as he said. Hallelujah. Take the bread with me, please. The bread that we are highly privileged to eat today represents the body of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Messiah. You just were reminded of what he did. As you eat, remember how he offered his holy body to receive God's justice against your sin. Eat and be thankful. Think about how we all eat together. We all eat together because together we are the body of Christ. We eat that which represents his body together because we are his body. Isn't that amazing? Take the cup. This represents the representation of the blood that Jesus himself shed. By drinking it, we are highly privileged to express in worship and thanksgiving to God that we, through faith, not through any doing of ourselves, we, through faith, are partakers of the very covenant, the new covenant, that is sealed in Christ's blood which he shed. Isn't that amazing? Our salvation is in his blood. Amen? Drink and be thankful. Marvelous. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I'd like to point out to you that what we just did is in a different form, a different setting, but it's what Jesus did with his own disciples before he went out and was betrayed and went through all this. And they concluded their, the first ever Lord's Supper, by singing a hymn. And so we're going to do the same. So stand up with me, please. Our singers, are you guys here? Come on up. Let's have some singers come up here to help us with this. And 
We are going to turn this at 176. Lead me to Calvary, which is where the name of the hill where Jesus died. to and coming back to and coming back to consistently for as long as you live here because you will worship for all eternity our Lord but one of the real essences of worship is that this what we just did and I think I think that's why the Lord ordains it dare dare I say what I think the Lord's motives are but you have to keep these things ever present in your mind. Life in this world is like this constant competition for your mind. And we need to keep fresh in our minds the things that the Lord has done for us. And, and what we just did here is at the foundation of it all. Like if we drift and degrade in our spirit and in our minds into like the cross like not holding any special, high, magnificent, awesome place in our minds, then we've drifted far, right? And so that's why I so appreciate the high 
point of worship that the Lord's Supper is. And you need to keep coming back to it and back to it and back to it. It's part of that not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together because we gather together to eat together because we are together the redeemed, his body, his church. This is the gathering of the church and not just to break bread and drink the cup, but I think in some ways especially to break the bread and drink the cup, but all of our assembling together. It is the visible, tangible manifestation of the mystery which is the body of Christ, his church. Right? The, the tangible manifestation of it in this world is when Christians gather. And you must not forsake that assembling because this is what it's our expression of worship and praise to God and it is our testimony to the world and it is God's own demonstration to the world that he is redeeming and gathering and redeeming his chosen, his elect from all nations of the earth, his redeemed who believe on the name of Jesus to himself. You get that? It's a high call that you have both the privilege and the responsibility as his redeemed to participate in as a matter of priority. It's both the physical act of getting up and gathering and the spiritual discipline of keeping it ever present in your mind and in your heart and holding it in the highest regard. Any diminishment of any part of that will not do. Understand? Good morning. Again, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to continue with our service. Now, a couple of uh, quick announcements. Um, may I first say that we are very blessed and privileged, in case you haven't noticed, because he's hiding in the back back there. But we're blessed and privileged to have Brother Brian back with us today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, he was actually at the men's fellowship yesterday, but now here he is back uh, among us with, uh, with the saints and with the church. And if it seems like there have been a number of times lately where we have welcomed Brian back into our presence, that's because there have been. And, uh, and, and nobody would like for that to slow down more than Brian himself. There he goes. But you know what? God's will, God is sovereign. And not our will, the Lord's will be done and the Lord is sustaining our brother. I know teaching him probably many things through the, the trial as we all learn through trials, but let's just continue to pray for our brother, all right? Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, we'll have youth group tonight at six o'clock here at the church. Tuesday night, we have our prayer meeting online. Uh, that is at nine o'clock on Facebook Live. Thursday night will continue. We're into the last chapter now of 1 Corinthians, entering chapter 16. That'll be Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Come in person or join in online as you wish. Okay? All right. Um, let's have a time of prayer together. Let's bow before the Lord and let me lead us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this high privilege that it is to break the bread and drink the cup as you did, sharing in communion and fellowship with you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you that you redeemed us and saved us from our sins by your own sacrifice and your own death. You took the penalty and the punishment that we deserve. We know that. And we rejoice in your goodness. We look and we're humanly distressed at what you went through to accomplish it, but we're also very, very grateful because you stepped in and made a way for us to really escape, well, be saved from that fate which we have earned and deserved by our own sinfulness. You rose from the dead and we worship you, our Lord Jesus. May the word of the gospel of you, Lord Jesus, spread far and wide through us, your church. Help us to take the admonishment seriously, to assemble and to be a testimony in your sight and to the world around us 
that you are gathering your elect to yourself. And then one day, the last trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise incorruptible, and those who are still remaining here will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Until that moment, help us, Lord God, to be faithful to everything that you have called us to and help us to always abound in your work. Lord, thank you so much for our dear brother Brian being back with us today. Thank you for hearing our prayers for him. Thank you for his love for you and his commitment to you and to your church. And I pray, Lord God, you would continue to help him to recover and get strong and just glorify you, Lord God, in his life. Thank you, Lord God, for the loving, faithful brother, the good fellowship we have with our brother Brian, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for just anyone else in our congregation who needs some kind of touch from you, a touch of healing, a touch of encouragement, just a touch of love and comfort. Maybe even among us there are people that need to be rebuked and corrected. That's your love that you do that. Even your chastening is a sign of your love as a father loves a child. Whatever is needed in the life of your children, we ask that you would please, according to your will and your time, bring it, Lord God, that we might be just right before you the way that we ought to be. Help us to abound in good works, abound in gospel preaching, abound in good discipleship, abound in love for one another. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. One more thing I just forgot. It came to my mind. Dear Father in heaven, we lift up also to you our brother Scott. I know, Lord God, that uh, our brother Scott loves you and we're so grateful to have him back in our fellowship. I know he's going for some kind of procedure tomorrow, Lord God. We thank you for the wisdom that you give to men. Lord God, to be able to treat this and that. And, you know, men have wisdom, but you're the source of it. Yes. You're the fountain of it, deep and immeasurable. And we praise you. We pray that everything would go well for our brother and that your will would be done in him and that you would glorify your name. Thank you that we can pray to you and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, amen. Amen, amen. Now, uh, do we have any Sunday school students here today? I think we do. Come on up here, guys. Yeah, let's encourage them. Let us all pray for the kids. Thank you, Lord, for these children who've come to hear your word. I pray for the teacher teaching them. I pray that you will help them to hear it and understand it and absorb it and memorize it and make it the deepest foundation for the rest of their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, hallelujah. Now we have Sean as usual, a little shortened time in the Word on days that we have the Lord's Supper, but that's okay. Let's continue where we were last week. Would you open with me quickly, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 22. Acts 22. I had six points out of this passage that I wanted to make last week. I got through three of them. Well, almost. I'm still on the third, and maybe we'll finish them today, and maybe we won't. However, the Lord leads us. But they're all things, I think, that are worthwhile to study. Get your, get your page-turning fingers ready, too, because we're going to flip to a couple of other passages from here. Now, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 22, 22-22, we read through this, and... Uh, I think, I think we satisfactorily covered this part. Look at chapter 22 and verse 30, and I'll start my reading there. Chapter 22 and verse 30. Dear Father, help us as we read your word now to receive it and be instructed in it in whatever way pleases you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
for this privilege. Amen. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when, the, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. And I read past that last week, and my intention is to tie what comes next into this. I doubt we'll have time for that today. If we do, I'll just read it again when we get there. All right, so what we saw in our lesson last week from this was number one, remain calm and clear thinking and seek the Lord for wisdom. Even the men in the men's fellowship yesterday, we looked at the book of Job and we saw how Job described how men can do all sorts of things. In Job's day, men knew how to drill for ore and make all sorts of iron instruments and everything else. Men knew how to mine for gold and make themselves rich. Men knew how to build things and design things. But what men could not do was source wisdom themselves. You couldn't like quantify or find a place where you could tangibly find wisdom. That alone is in God. And all of the wisdom that men have, I want you to think about this, all of the wisdom that men have to do anything, it's from God. Even godless men have their wisdom from God. Even men who would never in their lives give praise to the true and living God, whether they like it or not, the wisdom that they have was designed into them by their creator. It doesn't matter if they acknowledge him or not in that sense. That just makes it more of a crime that they don't acknowledge him, right? But the source of wisdom is God. And we learned last week that we should be constantly turning to the Lord for wisdom. As the Apostle James wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, that happens to all of us sometimes, right? And specifically when James said this, it was in the context of when you're going through trials in life. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. In other words, generously. God gladly and generously gives people wisdom if they ask for it because he's the source of it and there is something that he loves to give. Right? When Solomon was told by God, ask me for anything you want, God was very, very pleased that Solomon did not ask for wealth or strength to defeat all of his enemies, or, or that God would just make him great and mightier than anyone else. He said, Lord, these are your people. Give me wisdom that I might govern your people in a way that pleases you. Well, don't you know that the Lord was very, very happy with that request? Because God is this infinite well of wisdom. And what, what can be more honoring to God than to, in faith, recognize that you need the wisdom that he has that he can give to you. What can be more God-glorifying and faith-expressing than that? So that's number one that we saw last week. And then number two, we saw that the hardships of life don't have to overtake you 
just like they were not overtaking Paul, who is the example in the story that we've been reading here. Jesus, even in speaking of the trials of the last days in Matthew 24, said, see that these things don't trouble you, right? So even in the midst of the hardest of times, and none of us, for all the trials we've gone through, have endured anything like the tribulation that's coming on the earth. But Jesus said, even in that, don't be troubled, because Jesus has overcome them all. So you don't have to be overtaken by the troubles of life. <coughs> I'm sorry, that's probably, really, that's probably really loud into my microphone. But don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. <laughs> okay. Then the third point, and this is where we got to, was to speak the truth always. And that came up right in the beginning of what we read here in chapter 23 and verse 1. Now look, Paul is standing in front of a group of people that we already know want him dead and have already physically laid hands on him and have beaten him. Right? So he knows this is a group that doesn't believe anything that he says. But then... When the Roman governor, or not the governor, but when the Roman official decides he really wants to know what's up with all this, because, you know, this guy doesn't know. Why? I mean, these people we read were actually grabbing fistfuls of dirt and throwing them up in the air and, and, and you know, uh, starting this big riot and, 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 and screaming and, and everything else and raising their voices. And, 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 and the, the Paul, when he addresses the crowd says, I met Jesus, and Jesus told me to take the message to the Gentiles, and they just went crazy again. And the, the, the Roman leader is trying to figure out what is going on with these people. I mean, any Roman official that was in Judea, especially in Jerusalem, for any extended period of time would recognize that these sorts of religious squabbles and debates and tumults rose up all the time. But... Uh, why this guy Paul? I mean, it, to him, it probably seemed that Paul was doing what he would, that their God would want them to do, you know, going around and preaching about the true God to the whole world. So he wants to know what's up. And it says that he released him from his bonds in verse 30, called the Sanhedrin back, you know, the religious leaders, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. Now, Here's where Paul needs courage. Because Paul must know that if he goes back into the ground that he had just tiptoed in the day before, I shouldn't say tiptoed, Paul never tiptoed, did he? That Paul dove headfirst into the day before. He knows that they do not accept that he's doing the will of God, for sure, right? But the lesson in what Paul does here is a very simple and straightforward one for us. Look what he says. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. That seems all by itself to be what might be just a very gentle, easily understood kind of statement to make. But in the context of what's going on, this infuriated them. And Paul had to know that it would. I mean, Paul said to them the day before, the Messiah appeared to me and told me that my mission was to take this message of salvation by grace through faith to the Gentiles. They hated that and they wanted him dead. And now Paul gets another chance to say it to the religious leaders and to them, he basically just says, I have lived in a clean conscience. Now, notice how he starts. He calls them men and brethren, like he has previously, right? So he addresses them as respectfully as one possibly could, even though they were beating him the day before. He addresses them with respect and with genuine love, for he calls them brethren. And they're not brethren in the, like we are brethren kind of sense, they're not brothers in Christ. They don't, they don't believe on Christ. But he calls them brethren because he recognizes he was one of them. So that love is there. That's a good way to remember to address people. That's not the main point here, but that's something you ought to remember. 
Everyone just look at me a minute. Look at me. I want this to sink in. When it comes to a lot of the issues of the day, we allow ourselves, we insist that we are informed by the Bible on things, right? And when we get an opportunity to say things, we should. But may I ask you please to remember men and brethren. May I ask you please to remember that when we address people even who we may have the fiercest disagreements with about things, please remember how the Apostle Paul addressed people that beat him up the day before with respect and with love. Respect and love should be instantly recognizable trademarks of Christians. Even those, listen, Jesus told us to love our enemies and to pray for our enemies. We're not exempt, right? So please remember that. Now, with that said, though, what did Paul do? He courageously, knowing what was going to come his way, told them the truth. And that's the main point that I want to get here. Respect, yes. Love, yes. A desire to obey God, yes. Emanating from all of that always should be what? The truth. Tell the truth. And that is the point. Tell the truth in relation to lying, of course, right? As opposed to lying, I should say. You know, don't lie. Lying is sinful. Lying is something that New Testament Christians are commanded to put away and put out of themselves. But that's not really the point here. The point here is tell the truth even if it is something that requires a great deal of courage and may get you in trouble. That relates to how we preach the gospel to people. That relates to sometimes what we say about some of the issues of the day. Say it with love and say it with respect, but tell the truth and be a person who stands on the truth. I have a great example of this that I want to read to you from the scriptures. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 22? And I want to read a passage of scripture to you that I actually read to the youth group a couple of weeks ago and make a few points about this. I feel it's 1 Kings chapter 22. And I want to read to you about the Bible is such a big book and the main character and the main hero of the Bible, if you want to say from a literary standpoint, is God. And of course, what God does through Jesus, his son. But then along the way, you get like the Moseses, you get the Davids, you know, you get the Elijahs, you get the Josiahs, you get the, um, you get the John the Baptists, you get the Pauls, right? You get the people that are like, the ones that God just incredibly amazingly seemed to use so gloriously and fruitfully. And then there are others that are like that, but we don't know their names so well. And strictly from a literary standpoint, I would say to you that a man named Micaiah from 1 Kings chapter 22 is another one of those people who look at the example of how God worked in him and through him. So let me read this story to you, First Kings, and watch what we're talking about is standing for the truth courageously, even though you know what it might get you. Now, three years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Some of the uh, more modern translations might render that Aram. Um, where we get the word Aramaic from rather than Syria, but the same general region. Not Assyria, but, but Syria. It came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. That's meaningful because Judah and Israel were two separate kingdoms at this point, split in half after the days of Solomon. All right? But... Uh, they were constantly at war with one another from those first days after Solomon. So for a king of Judah to go and visit a king of Samaria would have been quite a noteworthy event. 
Believe it or not, they were enemies much, much more than they were friends after the days of Solomon. And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours? That's a city in the north of Israel. If you looked at a map, the kingdom of Israel was the kingdom to the north that included ten tribes. The king of Judah was to the south. And you notice, like, we would, we would say that, that Jehoshaphat went up to Israel because we think in terms of north and south. Notice that it said that he went down to visit because whenever somebody left Jerusalem, they went down. That's how that was, that's throughout the Bible, that's viewed like that. So Ramoth and Gilead, it says, we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria, right? The, the Arameans, the Syrians, had come down into the northern parts of Israel and captured some of their territory. So he said to Jehoshaphat, this is the king of Judah, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people is your people, my horses is your horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of Yahweh today, the word of the Lord today. Right? So, right there, you see one of the biggest differences between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel had pretty much rejected Yahweh and worshipped every imaginable God. They had become religiously like the most pagan of nations. Ahab's wife was a woman named Jezebel who was a worshiper of the god Baal, you know, maybe the, the chief of all the pagan gods of the region. All right? But the southern tribe of Judah still worshipped Yahweh. They had good kings and bad kings. Jehoshaphat is remembered as one of the good kings of Judah, one who was faithful to Yahweh. So, so you, have, you, have, uh, you have Ahab, the king of Israel, saying, let's go up and fight against the king of Syria and get Ramoth and Gilead back. And you have Jehoshaphat saying what? Let's, let's inquire of the Lord. Let's inquire of Yahweh and see what his will is, right? So you see the difference right there. That's a good lesson in and of itself, but I want to get to Micaiah. Then the king of Israel gathered prophets together, about 400 men, quite a crowd, right? So the king of Israel has got this little army of prophets, 400 of them, to get to come and ask of the Lord, which is, you read that in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles a lot. When a king wanted to know something from the Lord, he would call a prophet and ask the prophet to pray and ask the Lord. And then the Lord would give an answer, if it was his will, to the prophet to speak. So, shall I go against them? Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight or shall I refrain? And look, they said, 400 of them said, go up for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Right? All 400 of them. Yes, 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 go up. Now Jehoshaphat might be a little bit uh, skeptical of this. So he says, Is there not still a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? You see, Ahab's 400 prophets were not all prophets of Yahweh. They were prophets of false gods and all sorts of things, right? But Jehoshaphat's not interested in that. Jehoshaphat wants to hear from someone who's a prophet of his God, of Yahweh, the true living God. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there's still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him. Because he does not prophesy good concerning me, only evil. <laughs> Let's not ask him because he's not going to say what we want to hear. Right? Right? Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, bring Micaiah the son of Imlah here quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, which was the capital city of the northern kingdoms of Israel. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Now listen to this cat. Now, Zedekiah, the son of Chenaanah, had made horns of iron for himself. And he said, thus says Yahweh, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they're destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, go up to Ramoth and Gilead and prosper, for Yahweh will deliver it into the king's hands. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, 
Now listen. All right? A little behind the scenes look here. Now listen. The words of the prophets with one, in, one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. Ready? Here comes the point. Ready? This is the point right here. And Micaiah said, As Yahweh lives, whatever Yahweh says to me, that I will speak. Micaiah wasn't a yes man. Micaiah wasn't arbitrarily positive and encouraging either. Because God isn't. God is a God of truth, even if the truth is hard. And like Paul stood in front of that crowd, the Sanhedrin, and said, everything I've done, I've done with a good conscience. And God himself smacked because of it. So Micaiah, when told, listen, there's 400 other guys in there representing all sorts of different gods. Even one of them, Zedekiah, was speaking for our God, Yahweh, you know, and, and said, with, just like with these horns, you're going to gore the Syrians. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, let's go. Please say something good and encouraging for the king. Micaiah's like, look, if Yahweh wants me to say something good and encouraging, I will. If Yahweh wants to give him some bad news, I will. But whatever Yahweh says, the truth, the truth, that's what I'm going to speak. Can't just leave it there, can we? Verse 15. He came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? <laughs> Someone said to me yesterday, does the Lord have a sense of humor? Watch, watch, how, watch the cleverness and the cheekiness of Micaiah's answer. He answers him, go and prosper, for Yahweh will deliver it into the hand of the king. He's being sarcastic, right? So the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of Yahweh? Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And Yahweh said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said, In other words, in other words they were going to lose. In other words, if you go up there, you're all going to be scattered and you're all going to die and you're going to lose. That's what he's telling them. And the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And Yahweh said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before Yahweh and said, I will persuade him. Yahweh said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. In other words, you understand what he's doing. Micaiah is standing there and saying, all 400 of these other ones are liars. And God says so. He's telling the truth, right? And Yahweh said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, Yahweh has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. And Yahweh has declared destruction against you. You remember Zedekiah with his little horn thing that, that uh, said you're going to go up and gore them? Zedekiah, the son of Chenaana, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek. That, that sounds quite a bit like the story we're reading in the book of Acts, doesn't it? Just like Paul got himself smacked, Micaiah got himself smacked for what? Telling the truth. Telling the truth. So this false prophet, Zedekiah, says to him, after he smacks him, he says, Which way did the Spirit from Yahweh go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. 
and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. Does Micaiah back down from that? No. Micaiah says, If you ever return in peace, Yahweh has not spoken by me. Then he said, Take heed, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. Isn't that something? Courageous guy, right? So he, you can tell he's a little nervous, right? Because like he, he, the king of Israel is going to disguise himself, but he wants Jehoshaphat to go in looking like a king. Which does what? It, make, it, make, it makes Jehoshaphat more vulnerable. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the 32 captains of his chariot, saying, Fight with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. But of course the king of Israel was disguised, right? So it was when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, they said, Surely that's him, that's the king of Israel. Therefore they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out, and it happened when the captains of the chariots saw that it was not the king of Israel that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. They turn, they all turn when they realize this isn't Ahab and they all start riding away in their chariots. And on the way back, you know, you've seen like a Western movie or something like that and someone's riding away on their horse and just as they're riding away, they turn around and they fire one more shot. That's what one of these guys did. One of the guys in the chariots just turned around and didn't even aim, just randomly, boop, let an arrow go. And look, look what the arrow did. It hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle for I'm wounded. The battle increased that day. And the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening. So, what's the lesson in all this? Stand for the truth because the truth will always be borne out to be what it is that God once said. Right? The truth of the gospel. The truth concerning issues the truth concerning anything, irrespective of what it might bring you in your life. And not with arrogance, not with pride, not with combativeness, not with anything other than love for the person you're speaking to. Respect for the person you're speaking to. The New Testament says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. Brethren, this should not be so. Right? Because all men, even those who hate God, all men have been created in the likeness, in the similitude of God. Every man and woman bears his image. Even the ones who do things that are abominable in God's sight, they still bear his image. And you don't know, they might be someone who, if the gospel is preached to them, might repent and believe and be saved. Only God and His sovereignty knows that. And so here's what you do. You do what Paul did. You do what Micaiah did. And in courage, and in humility, and in love, and in respect, no matter what it might bring you, because it glorifies God, you speak the truth and you stand on the truth. I think that's where we'll leave it for today. Let's bow before the Lord and close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, help us learn the lessons from Scripture that we see. Though the subjects of these accounts are men, really behind it all is you. We read of Paul but it's you, the God of Paul, who worked mightily in him and through him. It's you that gave Paul compassion and love and respect in his heart. It's you that gave him courage to speak the truth, even though he knew the Sanhedrin would give him what he got. It is you, most holy God, 
who worked in Micaiah to speak the truth and to stand on the truth even though it got him locked up. Help us to learn from the examples that you give for it is you who worked in these men and we pray that you would work in us like that. Give us, Lord, a spirit of love and respect for all those around us, even that we would pray for our enemies. And we pray that people who now don't like you or respect you or love you or fear you, we pray that they would turn to repentance and repentance and faith and receive the gospel and be saved. And that you would use us to walk humbly and lovingly and respectfully and speak the truth of the gospel. Give out the truth of the gospel faithfully. Even if it might get us mocked, let it glorify you. Help us to be people of the truth. Thank you, Lord, for this assembly we've had here today. And thank you for all of your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Would you stand up with me, please? This is where we're going to end our service. Would you stand with me, please? All right. Praise the Lord. I want to thank you all for being here today and for joining in our service today. Thank you to those of you who have joined in online. This will be the uh, conclusion of our service now. Remember everything that's going on. Remember the, uh, the prayer time on Tuesday night online. Remember the Bible study coming up Thursday night. And enter in. Join into these things, all right? And uh, we do receive an offering here at our church that is used to underwrite the church's budget that our membership votes on. And uh, your, your support in that way is needed and is very, very much appreciated. Thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness to that. If you want to give, if the Lord puts that on your heart, you can put an offering in the box on the table in the foyer, or you can also give online. But thank you very much for that, and all praise and glory to the Lord. All right, so thank you again for being here today, everyone. God bless you. Deacon Chris, would you close our service with a word of prayer? Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for being here.